The Kurdish Women's Liberation Movement is a um, decades-old uh, social movement. It's a political movement uh, which has been resisting against uh, different nation-states in the Middle East, but also it has been resisting against uh, larger transnational and international uh, systems of violence and oppression more generally. Uh, we cannot understand the so-called Kurdish issue, which actually is not a Kurdish issue, it's a regional issue, it's an international colony, as some people are saying. Uh, it's a product of the violence of the nation-state system in general. We cannot understand it without also thinking about um, legacies of colonialism, imperialism, capitalism, but also, as the Kurdish women's movement itself often says, many of these systems of violence in the world come from patriarchy. So to understand patriarchy as one of the oldest forms of oppression and to see also how patriarchy is actually one of the issues that uh, creates and generates violence on a global scale. And this applies specifically in the context of Kurdish women and generally Kurdish society, for example, when you look at how different states in the region also reproduce patriarchy in different ways. And it's of course not just a problem concerning Kurdish women, at the same time women in all of these countries, uh, in Iran, in Turkey, in Syria, in Iraq, in the Middle East and in the world more generally, many of these problems are linked to the entanglement between these different systems of power. So actually, when we study the Kurdish women's liberation movement, we don't just study a small community somewhere in a violent part of the Middle East, we also study the world in many ways. So um, in my book, I explain the, a bit about the history, which I never feel I can do justice to this history because it's a collective uh, social history from below. It's a history that is written and is being written by struggling women, by working women, by imprisoned women, and by many women who are on a daily basis being assassinated. So in that sense, it's really uh, just a snapshot to understand what are the issues that the Kurdish women's liberation movement is uh, addressing, what are its political analyses, what are its um, kind of desires, what are its political projects, what has it built on the ground, what are the attacks that it's facing, but more importantly, why is it important for feminists, for women's movements, for social movements in the world to really connect and not just to be in solidarity, though, but to be in common struggle with the women resisting in Kurdistan. And I think recent developments in the region have shown just why it's so important to resist together against uh, patriarchy and capitalism and the state in the Middle East and beyond. Of course, in the person of Gina Amini, we see uh, multiple identities and multiple forms of oppression. Uh, she was not uh, from Tehran, she's from Kurdistan, she's a Kurdish woman, uh, she's a working woman, she's a young woman, uh, she's a woman from many, you know, her identities, her cultural backgrounds are minoritized and oppressed in the context of Iran. Uh, so it's very interesting to see how uh, the killing echoed and sparked so much reaction in different constituencies all over Iran, but how quickly also it resonated with, for example, people in Latin America, in Abyayala, who are resisting against feminicide, or against different people from oppressed communities, colonized communities, who see state violence in their lives. And the kinds of, um, you know, the, the, the reflex was actually a societal reflex and the fact that uh, the slogan Junjian Azadi was then uh, translated also into Farsi and uh, many other languages and became a global phenomenon shows actually, you know, these individual words, they don't just apply to one specific context, but they also at the same time speak to a larger reality that actually the peoples of our region really need revolution. But the problem is that very often we don't know what revolution means you know protests alone or uprisings alone that don't translate into a longer term strategic organization into a perspective ideological and political perspective to build community to build alternatives they can quickly disappear because not just because the people not because the people don't like they have the passion they sacrifice many people die many people lose their lives many people get imprisoned 
but in order for their losses to not be in vain, the people who survive and who continue these movements need to really think sustainably about what do we actually want to achieve. So often the peoples in our region are forced to ask for help from the outside, you know, these kinds of this regime change model, which is an imperialist model, of course, and it's not actually necessarily going to help the community transform. It's not necessarily going to abolish patriarchy in that place, for example. So this is why these social reflexes, the fact that so many people are ready to risk their lives in the street, we need to understand this very well. And it's up to people who are politically organizing, who are formulating perspectives, to turn this into something that is sustainable and will last so that these don't become protests that disappear after a few months and a few slogans that people say for a while and then... So that's why I think struggling together is very important. This cannot happen without, you know, connecting the resistance movements and the kind of protests, but also just the longer term experiences of women in the region more broadly, which is why in the Kurdish women's movement we speak of a regional women's revolution, a world women's revolution, because patriarchy cannot be abolished in one place alone. So in that sense, um, it's really important to see the opportunities that arise, but also really the risks of, of co-optation, of foreign intervention, uh, because we have so much of that in the history of our region and foreign forces usually never want actual social revolution for our peoples. They have other agendas. And this is why I think um, doing revolution from a women's perspective is different, or from a feminist perspective, uh, is different from these old school models of revolution where someone comes and then demands uh, you know, a kind of a change of who is in power, but the entire infrastructure remains the same. What we say is women's revolution is a long per process. It's about uh, changing the men inside our societies. It's about um, changing the economy. It's, it's a long, long, long process. So just protests alone for a few weeks, that is not revolution. What is revolution is how you build an alternative life in the long term. And that's only we can do together. So,